بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن تتوب إلى الله فقد صغت قلوبكما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام إنها قوامة صوامة وهي زوجتك في الجنة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to our series on the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, insha'Allah, we will further our discussion on one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After we've discussed the lives of 10 of the men from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we then began with a few of the women from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life. Very great women that played a very great role. And we continued with this trend. And after covering Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu anha, and then Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and of course, a little bit on Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha on the same day. We will now discuss another very great woman in the history of Islam and a great woman, also the daughter of a very great man in Islam as well. So just a reminder for those of us who may have been receiving that new message that is coupled with the one asking us to tune in at seven o'clock every evening. Um, that message there is to encourage us as to how we can use this time a little more efficiently or wisely than we already may be doing. Alhamdulillah, with all the Qur'an that we're reciting and the salat that we're performing and the adhkar that we're completing, the du'as that we read for our protection and all the other good. Some of us may be taking classes online, some of us may be teaching, some of us, whatever it is that's keeping us busy, if we can possibly, literally, take out, I don't think this is, at least for now, going to take more than 10 seconds of your time. 10 seconds of your time is what's being asked of you to learn one more name of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we learned Ar-Rahman yesterday and today we learned Ar-Rahim. Hopefully we can continue like this, learning, memorizing one new beautiful name of Allah every day and then 98 days from now, we can have a little virtual jalsa, a little, a little ceremony online because we're not allowed to get together. No, five is the maximum and even that. We're advised to stay at home, stay safe, save lives. So anyways, every single day, if we learn one of the names. So I've been applying this to my students for the last so many years. When I sent this message out to one of them, he's become a scholar now, mashallah. He gives his own talks and he just spent time in the, in the subcontinent. He's just come back recently. He messaged me, he said some good news for you. I said, what? He said, I already memorized these when you taught me these in grade seven. He's become a scholar now, he's graduated from school, he's moved on to other chapters in his life. In grade seven, when I had applied the same thing that I'm applying now to, I mean, with all due respect to elderly people, we have doctors in that broad class list, we have elders, we have, mashallah, very great people. But I applied this when he was in grade seven. This is probably around 10 years ago, and it worked, alhamdulillah. Till this day, he knows all the 99 names of Allah. So we should try every single day, learn one name. It won't be too much. 98 more days from now, sorry, 97, we can have a little virtual jalsa online. So coming back to the Sahaba series now, the very great woman under discussion today is a woman by the name of Hafsa binti Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. We know from yesterday, oh by the way, we've got these friends that send out these messages and they look for every little detail. I mean, I appreciate the fact that they listen, but they listen very carefully. So one of the brothers, one of the friends, he messages me after the talk on my way home. He says, brother, you mentioned in one narration that there were nine things that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha had been given preference to over the other wives. I said, you're absolutely right, and I'm not going to lie, I actually forgot the 10th one. What was the 10th one? She says, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, that while all the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to enjoy one day and one night when it was their turn with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I, said Aisha, used to enjoy two days and two nights with the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Why was this, of course? Because Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was more elderly, she had given up her turn voluntarily 
to the Prophet ﷺ for Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. This is why I used to get two nights and two days with the Prophet ﷺ, while all of the other wives used to get one day and one night. And regardless, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was a very great woman indeed. Khadija al-Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha was a very great woman indeed. And today, Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now imagine the father, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The mother, Zainab. Zainab bint Mad'oon radiallahu ta'ala anha. These are the early comers into the fold of Islam. They are the ones who have embraced the faith, the new faith, the religion. Earlier on, much her uncles are also remarkable Muslim, uh, remarkable Muslims, great individuals. These are people who whom Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi was very close to. So she's from a family of such great people, and I mean, she's the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. That's the bottom line. Yes, yeah, she wasn't the daughter of Abu Bakr and Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And Umar radiallahu anhu used to remind her, and we'll come to find out just now. He used to tell her, Hafsa. You aren't Aisha and your father isn't Abu Bakr. I mean, they're all great. Hafsa and Aisha, Abu Bakr and Umar, Radhiwanullah ta'ala alayhi majma'in. But of course, still we know. I mean, Aisha was Aisha, Hafsa was Hafsa, Umar was Umar, and Abu Bakr in his Siddiq radiallahu was the greatest after all the Prophets alayhi wa salatu was salam. So here's Hafsa radiallahu anha. Before even coming to and joining this great group of women titled the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, of all of the believers until the day of judgment. Before she was inducted, so to say, or before she was selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into this great category of women, she was actually married to somebody else. Like we heard yesterday as well, and I think I was going to make this point earlier on also, but then I got digressed, my attention went to something else from yesterday. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was the only one that was married to the Prophet sallallahu as a virgin. Yes, Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha was almost, almost the same age. I mean, of all the wise, if there was anyone that was close in age or the closest in age to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, then of course it was Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. So Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala was married to another man, a man by the name of Khunais ibn Hudhafa al-Sahmi. Now he was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. He was a remarkable individual. He was fortunate to have made hijrah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba from Makkah to Mukarramah to Madinah. So he so, so hijrah as well. And then we know a little after the Hijrah, in the second year after Shawwal, uh, in the second year after Hijrah, in the month of Ramadan rather, in the month of Ramadan in the second year takes place the Battle of Badr. He participates in the Battle of Badr. So he is a very great Sahabi. And we know, as a matter of fact, it's Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha who has the same woman, the same Sahabiya that we are discussing today, who had this discussion with the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam on one occasion when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam mentioned that all the Badriyun, all of those illustrious companions that participated, the 313 or 15 or 18, regardless, most probably the 313. I mean, you can't go wrong. If there was 315, we know for a fact there was 313. So those 313 that participated in the Battle of Badr, they will never enter the fire of hell. Included with those are those Sahaba who participated in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. They were 1,400 in number. Some of the details of which we've covered earlier on, and inshallah, hopefully COVID-19 comes to an end, but one day when we do begin outside of the virus these times when we begin the seer on the Prophet والسلام, we will go through those details again however it was her to whom the Prophet mentioned this that anybody participated in Badr or in the amongst those who were there in the treaty of Hudaybiyyah they will never see the fire of Jahannam they will never be made to enter it so Hafsa radiallahu anha, she was very sharp-witted. She was extremely, extremely intelligent. She was also a very smart woman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed her with this. Again, 
Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. Yes, yes, sometimes the apple does fall far. It, it falls far from the tree, but not in the case of Aisha and not in the case of Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, wait, no. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Holy Quran, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا Everyone will have to cross over the fire of Jahannam. Ooh, you've got an answer for the Prophet, I see. Okay. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then replied, Okay, Hafsa, ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ وَنَذَرُوا الظَّالِمِينَ فِيهَا جِثِيَّةً But as for those who did what Allah wanted them to do, and they refrained from doing what Allah didn't want them to do, in other words, the muttaqoon, that was the definition that I've given to you now, which was given to us by Hassan Basri, rahimahullah, a great, the sage of his age and a great giant scholar of Islam. This was his definition, a taqwa, to do what Allah wants you to do, and to refrain from doing what Allah doesn't want you to do. In a nutshell, in a very simple layman's terms and definitions, this is taqwa. Do what Allah wants, don't do what He doesn't want. So for those who had taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will save them. They will be saved from going into Jahannam. And those others, the others, those who were wrongdoers, they will be left and they will come on their knees on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us and make us amongst those those who are saved from the fire of Jahannam. So Rasulullah gave her this reply. Now Hafsa radiallahu was a very sm smart woman, but because she grew up in the household of Umar, perhaps radiallahu anhu, some of the characteristics, some of the traits or attributes of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu may have possibly rubbed off on her as well. She had a little temper and at times she might have even if not raised her voice but she would retort and she would talk back very few occasions but it has happened to the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam so be it as it may coming back to khunais ibn hudhafa to sahmi khunais participates in the battle of badr he participates in Badr. He is amongst the 313 is why we went that way for a moment because he was a Badri Sahabi. And Allah told the Badriyun, You people do what you want. You were in Badr, you made it. You've got nothing to worry about. Allah has forgiven every one of your shortcomings and sins. So he is a Badri Sahabi. He's a great companion of Rasul Sallallahu after participating in Badr or during the Battle of Badr, he had been wounded. And a short while later, he succumbed to those wounds as a result of which he left this world, departed, and went back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha was now widowed. She lost her husband at a very tender age. According to some narrations, she was only 18 at this time. Now you can imagine, you've lost your husband, it's going to be difficult for you. And not only is it difficult for the one who has lost their dear one, their spouse, but even for the father and for the mother to come home every day or to see that child who has lost their, that, that daughter who has lost their husband, you feel the grief and the, the anguish and the sorrow and you can see it. So Umar radiallahu naturally, and this is something as a matter of fact, it was also looked down upon to some extent amongst the Arabs of that era or that time. They didn't want to keep that daughter who had been widowed or for that matter, who had been divorced inside of their home for too long. So they would make an extra effort to try to get her to get married to somebody else. Now, however, marrying a widow or marrying a divorcee was not a taboo in that society like it is in this one, unfortunately. To them, there was no... I mean, how many of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were widows themselves? How many great companions married widows themselves? Anyways, or divorcees for that matter. So anyways, Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha is at home. Umar radiallahu anhu feels this. So he decides to initiate, to go out and propose on her behalf himself. And so who does he go to? The third greatest of all time. None other than Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu was married to a daughter of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was married to Ruqayya binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Ruqayya radiyallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, was married to Uthman bin Affan radiyallahu anhu. Ruqayya radiyallahu anha passed away from this world during the battle of Badr, not as a result of her participation. She didn't participate. As a matter of fact, Uthman bin Affan anhu too didn't participate. He was asked, he was requested, he was told by the Prophet ﷺ to stay in Madinatul Munawwara and take care of his daughter and of course his wife, the Prophet's daughter, take care of Ruqayya radiallahu ta'ala. She, she leaves the world. So Uthman radiallahu anhu has lost his beloved on one hand, and on the other hand, Ruqay, um, sorry, the daughter of Umar bin Khattab, Hafsa radiallahu anha, she has also, also lost her husband. So Umar radiallahu anhu puts two and two together. He says, let me go and ask Uthman. Maybe, you know, it'll become easier for both of them. He comes to Uthman radiallahu anhu, and he says, Uthman, if you please, I'd like to marry my daughter Hafsa to you. I propose to you on behalf of my daughter. What do you think? Uthman radiallahu anhu, at that time, he excused himself. He didn't give him an assertive response. He told Umar, give me a few days to think over this matter and I'll get back to you. So he didn't get back to Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu got back to him. He went back to him and he asked him, so okay, Uthman, have you thought over the matter? What do you think? I'd like my daughter Hafsa to marry you. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, well, I'm not actually ready for marrying anybody at this time. Fair enough. I mean, it's hard. And you want it, jackpot. You have Uthman bin Affan, radiallahu anhu. And it didn't happen. Okay, so let me try my luck again. He goes to Abu Bakr in Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, the first greatest of all time after the prophets. He just jumped from three to number one, and he is number two. So he goes to Abu Bakr and Siddiq radiallahu and he proposes to him on behalf of his daughter. He says, what do you think? I'd like my daughter Hafsa to be married to you, Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr radiallahu keeps quiet. Doesn't give any response. Umar radiallahu is a little upset now. According to some of the narrations, he's frustrated, he's angry. I asked, I mean, he didn't even give me an answer. After a f little while, the Prophet والسلام, would then get married to the daughter of Umar radiallahu anhu himself. And when Uthman radiallahu anhu had denied, he had declined rather, the offer presented to him by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, Umar didn't like this. And so he went to complain about Uthman to the Prophet وسلم, saying, you know, uh, you know, I offered Uthman my daughter and he doesn't want to marry her. You know, this doesn't seem to resonate. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him some glad tidings. He gave him some good news. He says, Zawajallahu Uthman khayram min, ibnat, min ibnatik wa zawajallahu ibnatak khayram min Uthman. Umar, you've got nothing to worry about. Allah is going to marry Uthman to someone better than your daughter, and Allah is going to marry your daughter to someone better than Uthman. So he was happy when he hears this. But then when he sees that Abu Bakr was also refused, uh, I don't know, I mean, who, who's better than this now? Then when the Prophet والسلام, married Hafsa binti Umar bin al-Khattab that's when he realized, indeed, yes, this is the pride of the universe. This is the, the most exalted creation. Like one poet said, Ya sahib al jamali wa ya sayyid al bashar, min wajhika al munir laqad nuwir al qamar, la yumkinu al thana akama kana haqqahu, ba'd az khudabu zurgutu i qissay muhtasar. I mean, that was the face from which the, the, the moon used to borrow its radiance. That was that face of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the most exalted after Allah, to make a long story short, was married to his daughter Hafsa radiallahu anha. He was elated, he, he was overwhelmed with joy. That is when Umar radiallahu ta'ala came to him and said, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu came to Umar and said, you know, Umar, I think you were upset with me, weren't you? You were a little angry when I said, when I didn't even reply. I didn't even reply, and let me tell you why I didn't reply. It was because I had heard 
the Prophet ﷺ make mention of Hafsa. And therefore I thought that perhaps he was interested in marrying your daughter himself. And I didn't want to disclose the secret of Rasul ﷺ to anyone. I waited for time to go by. And had he refused, had the Prophet ﷺ chosen not to marry Hafsa, I would have more than gladly accepted Hafsa anha for myself. To give that consolation to Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu. So here's Hafsa anha, a very remarkable woman, the wife of Rasulullah wasallam as well. She's narrated many ahadith from the Prophet wasallam. As a matter of fact, 60 of the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam have been narrated by Hafsa radiallahu anha. A couple of which are found both in the Sahihain of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. A few of which have been found in either one of the two books. And majority of the others, they are found in the other books of hadith. She has great sahaba narrating from her as well to begin with. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, whose life to a certain extent we've already discussed. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is her brother. She was six years older than him. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu had both um, as, uh, uh, Hafsa radiallahu anha as well as Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu from his wife Zainab bint Mad'un radiallahu ta'ala anha. So what we know that is very uh, famous in the life of Hafsa radiallahu anha is a particular incident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in the Holy Quran as well. In the chapter titled At-Tahreem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu lak. O Prophet, O Nabi, this is how Allah used to address the Prophet of Allah. Ya ayyuhan nabi, ya ayyuhal muzzammil, ya ayyuhal muddathir, ya ayyuhal rasul. Allah used to address him, not by his name, like other Prophets were addressed. Ya Yahya khudhi al-kitab, or Ya Musa, or Ya Isa ibn Maryam adhkur, or, or Ya, ya Adam uskun anta wa zawd. No, no. Allah used to address the Prophet by titles. These were beloved titles that Allah had given given to him himself. So Allah addresses him, Ya ayyuhal nabi, lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu lak? Why do you, why do you make for yourself something unlawful which Allah has made lawful for you? What is this? Or what is the back, what is the story behind the, the, the revelation behind this particular verse that was revealed? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to visit his wives on a daily basis just for, he used to just check up on every single one of them after Salatul Asr. This was his practice. And on one occasion when he went to check up on Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, obviously another wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would go and spend, just check up on her and he would sit with her for a short little while, while and Zainab radiallahu would prepare a specific drink for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which of course he enjoyed to partake of. Now in enjoying this drink with Zainab radiallahu sometimes this would take a little longer than he expected it to take, and this would thus take out time from the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this, this drink, particularly was made from honey. And this Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha would make this drink for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after which he would go and visit the other wives as well. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha's jealousy kicked in and she decided to conspire and hatch a little plan to try to get the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to stop drinking that and to stop spending so much time when he goes to check up on that wife. So he calls, she calls, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha makes this plan with Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she tells Hafsa, and in according to some narrations, we find that Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha was also a part of this plan. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha tells them, what we're going to do 
is that when the Prophet ﷺ comes to meet us, after he's already met Zainab anha and partaken of that, that juice or that, that drink that she prepares for the Prophet ﷺ, we'll mention to him that it seems like he must have eaten from a, a, a specific, a certain flower or an herb, a plant by the name of maghafir. Now this plant or this herb, it had a, a, a slight... A, a smell to it, a foul smell to it. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ was very particular in smelling not just good, but the greatest, the, the greatest scent would emanate from the Prophet ﷺ, his mouth, his body at all times. So they said, they said that we will tell the Prophet ﷺ, it's, it seems like that you've had this maghafid, this particular herb that doesn't give off a good smell when you consume it. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ goes to check up on Zainab. And after spending time there, he goes to Aisha and to the other wives, radiallahu ta'ala anhun. After coming to them, the Prophet ﷺ meets them. They mention, O oh Prophet of Allah, it seems like you've had maghafir. Now they're not making a statement. They may be asking this. So it's more interrogative than it is a, a statement. So like, have you had this maghafir? The Prophet ﷺ replied, no. I went and with Zainab, I had a, a, a drink made of honey. So they says, well, no, maybe the honey bee had had partaken of that plant, the maghafir, and this is why we, it seems like we can smell the maghafir. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, if that's the case, I take oath and I swear that I will never have maghafir again, or I will never partake of that drink. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that verse. There was no need for you to make it unlawful for you. It's something that you're allowed to have. So why are you making it haram, O Prophet of Allah, O Nabi? Now, after this incident had taken place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the very same verse. In tatuba ilallahi faqad sagat qulubukuma. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told this to Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha that I will never partake of this drink again but he told her to keep it a secret and don't let this be shared with anybody else lest Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha comes to find out and if she does that's not going to be good because her heart is going to be broken so try to keep this a secret and not disclose it to anybody else Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha failed to keep the secret of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and went ahead and disclosed it to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and perhaps others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse in tatuba ilallahi faqad sagat qulubukuma if both of you then repent to Allah for whatever had transpired if both of you then repent to Allah. Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah says, I wanted to know who were these two individuals that Allah had told through the Prophet ﷺ that if they were to repent, who were these two that were being told by Allah that they needed to repent? So he says, I was really eager to find out. And for one whole year, I didn't manage to find out. And I wanted to ask Umar ibn al-Khattab because I was sure he knew. But anyways, I didn't muster the courage to be able to ask him. When on one occasion we went, one year later we went to perform the Hajj. When we were returning from the journey of Hajj, Umar ibn al-Khattab had gone to answer the call of nature. And when he was returning, I had prepared the water for his ablution for him. So I took and seized this opportunity to ask him there and then. While pouring the water as he was washing his limbs, performing the wudu, I asked Amir al-Mu'mineen, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know those two women that Allah refers to in the Holy Quran that they needed to repent? Who are they? So... Umar radiallahu turned to Ibn Abbas and said, wait, Ibn Abbas, you don't know? They, they're Aisha in Hafsa. He says, oh, okay, okay, I see. And he says, I really wanted to ask you, it's been a whole year, but I couldn't muster the courage to ask. And well, I appreciate it now. Umar said, no, whatever you need to ask me, Ibn Abbas, you ask me. If I know, I will be able to help you and I will provide you the answer. Then Umar radiallahu anhu goes on. 
He mentions a story in detail. This is found in Sahih Bukhari in numerous chapters. Imam, Rah Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, mentions this hadith with different additions and subtractions, different narrations, different versions of the same hadith. He mentions it numerous times in Sahih Bukhari. Anyhow, it goes something like this. Umar anhu then mentions to Ibn Abbas anhu, basically what it was that you know, our women, before we came to Medina Tul Munawwara, when we were still in Mecca, we had the, the upper hand over them, and we used to control them, and we used to speak to them, and command them, and whatever it was that we wanted from them, everything seemed to be going smooth. But after we came to Medina, you know, everything was different. I don't know if they picked it up from the habits of the women in Medina, but they started to talk back to us. And what happened was on one occasion, I was talking to my wife, and whether I had just mentioned to her that I should do this, and she told me, no, you shouldn't do this. Maybe it isn't a good idea for you to be doing this she spoke in an ill manner she retorted and responded in a manner that wasn't pleasing to me I didn't like it I wasn't used to having somebody my wife talk to me like this so when she saw my reaction to her retort she said whoa Umar why is it that you seem so shocked? Why are you so uh, amazed at the manner in which I address you? Don't you know that some of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ address him in the same manner? And don't you know that sometimes he's upset with them the entire night? And sometimes this... Whoa! Umar was shocked! He couldn't believe his ears! He, doesn't, he didn't know how to stomach and digest what he was hearing from his wife. He said, what? If this is so, then indeed they are ruined. They have incurred loss. How dare they address the Prophet ﷺ in this manner. At once he goes to his daughter, Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. When he comes to Hafsa, he says, Oh Hafsa, is this true that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, including you, they address him in a manner like this? That you talk back to him and you retort to the Prophet ﷺ. I've told you before and I remind you again, don't you ever compete with Aisha radiallahu anha, whose beauty and whose love for the Prophet ﷺ, or his love for her. Don't you try to imitate and don't you let her misguide you or don't you try to compete with Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha. Umar radiallahu anhu couldn't understand. Anyways, he goes on with the story and then he mentions that, you know, I had this Ansari brother of mine who was from a particular tribe. Me and him used to take turns. He narrates this to Ibn Abbas. We used to take turns going to the Prophet ﷺ. So one day he would go to the Prophet, he'd come back to me and he would tell me exactly everything that he had learned and so on and so forth from the Prophet ﷺ regarding the deen. And the next day I would go and I would spend time in the company of the Prophet ﷺ and I would learn from him whatever it was and then I would share this with my Ansari, with my friend. But on this particular occasion, it was his turn. He was with the Prophet ﷺ. And one night when I was at home, he came knocking in a very strange manner. It was a very hard knock. So I went to go and answer. And I, I asked him what, it, what was wrong. And at that time, there was a people of Ghassan whose attack was inevitable. We feared that the people of Ghassan might attack us at any time. So this was always in the back of our minds. I thought perhaps this was news to tell us that Ghassan was about to attack. So when he came to me, I, he said something great has happened. I asked him, what is it? Have the people of Ghassan attacked? He said, no, something worse than this. I asked, what could possibly be greater than this? He said, the Prophet ﷺ has divorced his wives. Oh, when Umar ibn al-Khattab heard this, he went straight to the Prophet ﷺ. And first he goes to Hafsa and the other wives as well and asks them, is it true that the Prophet has divorced you, alayhi salatu was salam? She said, I don't know. And then he goes to Ummi Salam uh, radiallahu ta'ala and asks, and then she didn't like the fact that he was asking, why is it that you have to stick your nose into our business? We're the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Anyways, he comes to the masjid and he sees people there in the masjid playing with the pebbles. And he sees the people crying and weeping bitterly to anyone. He isn't addressing anyone. Has he really given divorce to all of his wives? If this is the case, then there's no more significance of Umar and his daughter in the eyes of Allah. If al Rasul ﷺ has given divorce to his daughter Hafsa, he can't help himself. He gets up at once, he leaves the masjid from the pulpit, and he sees a black slave of Rasul sitting there by the balcony where Rasul is in the upper floor inside of his Mubarak auspicious chamber or in his room. 
So he goes and he seeks permission from Rabah. He says, Oh Rabah, go ask the Prophet والسلام, that Umar ibn al Khattab would like to see him. Ask him if I can seek permission to come inside. Rabah goes inside and he asks the Prophet والسلام, and he see, receives no answer. So he comes back to Amir al Mu'minin Umar and he says, um, The Prophet والسلام, is not given any response. Umar al goes, Rabah, go back to the Prophet and ask him yet a second time and tell him that Amir al Mu'mineen or tell him that Umar, sorry, Umar seeks permission to come in. Ask him on my behalf. Rabah goes a second time, comes back with nothing. He goes back a third time, nothing. When Umar radiallahu anhu is about to get up and leave, Rabah returns and says, Oh Umar, he is welcoming you. He is asking you to come inside. Oh Umar radiallahu anhu that comes inside, inside of the Mubarak Hujjah or the chamber. In which Rasul is at the time when Umar radiallahu comes inside, he's still standing. And in one narration or one version of the hadith, Umar radiallahu anhu asks, Ya Rasulullah, is it true that you have given talaq to your wives? Rasulullah replies in the negative. He says, No, oh, Umar, no. Umar radiallahu anhu then says three times, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then the hadith is lengthy in which he mentions the entire story that I have mentioned to you just now. The entire story, he mentions the entire narration, he mentions everything, the details of which transpired inside of his own home. And then his going to Hafsa radiallahu anhu and asking her and then speaking to Umm Salama radiallahu anhu and asking her and then his coming to Rabah and then asking him and seeking his permission to come see Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He mentions all this. And and after he's a little calm and he sees that the signs of disapproval or the signs of disappointment on the Prophet ﷺ have subsided, Umar then sits down and when he sits down, he says, Ya Rasulullah, you know Kisra and Qaisar, the, the empires of Persia and Rome, they have all of this good that Allah has blessed them with, all of these riches and wealth. Why don't you make dua to Allah? Allah blesses with the same. When Rasul ﷺ hears this from the mouth of Umar, he gets up. He was lying down at this time. He gets up at this time and the mark from the straw mat on which the greatest body that the world has ever seen was lying down. These marks were visible on his body. And then he has just a pillow made of some fibers on which he was leaning. Rasul gets up at once and he asks, Afi shakin anta ya ibn al-Khattab. Are you still in doubt regarding this matter, O ibn al-Khattab? Why is it that you do, do you not understand, O Umar? Those are people, Allah has given them all of their goody goodies in this world. Whatever riches, whatever wealth, pomp, glamour that they have, Allah has given it to them in this world. And we are a people that Allah has kept it for us in the life hereafter. Are you not pleased with this, O oh Umar? Umar radiallahu anhu then asks, Ya Rasulullah, make dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive me. Anyhow, the story goes on, but this is a little bit about the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was also very close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Time, we've actually gone over time today, but it's fine. This is the same individual when Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left this world, and during the battle of Yamama, when many of those Sahaba who had memorized the Holy Quran, when they were, they had gone back to Allah, they had become shaheed and martyrs. They had, they, they the, the Ummah had lost such great entities. So Abu Umar radiallahu comes to Abu Bakr and says, Oh Abu Bakr, I think perhaps we need to start to compile the Holy Quran. We have lost so many hufad from the Sahaba. Imagine someone who is a hafiz from the companions of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so many of them have been lost in that one particular battle itself. So Umar says, Oh Abu Bakr, I think we should start to compile the Holy Quran. Abu Bakr said, It is impossible for me to take on that task, which was not taken on by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Umar insisted and he continued to mention this. He continued to persuade Abu Bakr until finally Allah had inspired Abu Bakr with, with the same feelings. So then Abu Bakr and Umar they both went to Zayd bin Thabit. Mark the name Zayd bin Thabit anhu, and they mentioned to him, Oh Zayd, perhaps we want you, someone who used to, was a scribe during the time of Rasul Sallallahu You were honored to write wahi in revelation when the Quran was being revealed. You were appointed by Rasul Sallallahu You have a remarkable memory. He had mastered the Hebrew language for Rasulullah Sallallahu because the Jews used to deceive Rasul Sallallahu He asked Zayd to learn the language. 
they'd mastered the Hebrew language within a short span of 15 days alone. You can imagine the intelligence that Allah has blessed this individual with. So they opined to him, O oh Zayd, we want that you begin to compile and collect all the Quran from wherever, from the parchment and from the barks and from the, the, the leaves and from the bones, wherever it, wherever it may possibly be, have been collected by the Sahaba and those who have memorized it as well. Go to every one of them and collect it and let us compile the Holy Quran. Zayd said, it is impossible for me to take on that which wasn't taken on by Rasulullah But eventually they persuaded him. Zayd anhu says, had they asked me to shift a mountain from its location, that would have been more easier for me than it was to take on the colossal task of compiling the Holy Quran. Anyways, Allah blesses Zayd bin Thabit. The Quran is compiled. It remains in the custody of Abu Bakr and his Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He goes back to Allah and leaves this world. It remains in the custody of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu for the entire life of Umar ibn al-Khattab of his Khilafah after he leaves this world. The Quran is then passed down to Hafsa radiallahu anha and she will be the custodian of the Holy Quran. Someone who had memorized the Holy Quran herself. Someone who used to narrate from Rasulullah herself. Someone from whom other tabi'een and sahaba radiallahu have narrated a hadith of the Holy Prophet herself. Another wife of Rasulullah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us to bring into our lives some of the qualities of these remarkable people. We haven't received the message, but perhaps tonight, inshallah, at 9.30, we will have the talk in Urdu, and we will also have the collective dua. So stay tuned, not from now until then, but be back at 9.30. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.